want to thank the user groups who organize this SQL Saturday. Uh, I want to thank everyone who organizes events at all. Uh, I am kind of sad that PASS as an organization ceased to exist because I think I have a lot to, to thank PASS and the PASS user groups for. And I'm happy that the, the user group and the community comes together even when PASS is, is gone as an organization. And I'm very thankful for Redgate for taking over some of the responsibilities. And I'm very thankful for SQL Saturday and Data Saturdays and so on to, to live on. Uh, because I have a lot to thank the community for, uh, I would not probably be a consultant at all. I wouldn't run my own company. I wouldn't be here to present if it wasn't for the community. And that has given me a network that, that kind of got me to to dare uh, start my own company and to dare, you know, tra travel mostly around Europe, but to some other places too, uh, and do presentations. So thank you everyone who, who has volunteered uh, during the 20 years, something that I have worked with SQL Server uh, and the people before them who, who really put in a lot of work to, to make things like this happen. So thank you everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, PowerShell and DBA tools uh, and a very short background about my journey with PowerShell. And I think some of you, uh, if you're fluent with PowerShell, you probably started the same way I did anyway. I had done some bash or scripting with on Linux with bash. I had done some scripting on um, on Windows, mainly with uh, you know VBA scripts. And I, I heard that PowerShell, shell, that's the new stuff. That's what you should know. And that's the only tool you should use to script and to administer stuff. So I kind of opened this prompt and I tried to write commands and I didn't really know what I, oh, okay, so it's another DOS prompt basically. Uh, so I didn't look at it. And then more people talked about PowerShell. So I thought, okay, I'll give it another go. And I started finding scripts uh, that I could kind of download and tweak them and get them to work without really knowing what they did. Uh, and then I was tasked with uh, uh, doing a migration from an on-premise data center to uh, kind of VMs in Azure. Uh, so we had one huge SQL Server instance and we were migrating it to four or five VMs in Azure. So it's kind of a lift and shift, but we did some splitting and we had service broker queues. So we had to set up remote queues between the instances and so on and get networking to work. And that's when I found DBA tools. Uh, and we did, and I'm going to show you a simplified version of it by the end of this presentation, but we did a we had standard edition on premise and we had standard editions in the VMs uh, in Azure. And we did a, a migration where we had basically one or two minutes downtime migrating all the databases and everything was automated with a kind of home cooked log shipping solution uh, that I used DBA tools to, to implement. So that's how I got into PowerShell was through DBA tools mainly. And after that, I've used PowerShell for so many things. Um, and if I can change slides, a few words about me. So I am a SQL Server specialist. I've worked with SQL Server for 20 plus years. I started as a developer uh, on web and Windows, Windows Forms. Actually, I started my journey as an IT consultant doing Microsoft Access programming, but I don't talk much about that. So, um, so I'm a, I've done DBA developer architect roles, but anything that has to do with SQL Server and a bit broader, you know, some Power BI and you know data platform as a whole, but mainly SQL Server and SSIS and and the things that are bundled with the SQL Server installation and the SQL Server license. In recent years, though, I've done some, uh, you know, I'm a networking amateur, I'm a load balancer beginner, uh, I'm a cloud noob, I'm a PowerShell developer. So 
in the DBA and database developer role, there are so many other things that has come into it. Uh, so you really need to know a little bit of everything. Uh, well, and I'm a community geek. Uh, I am one of the organizers of the Swedish SQL Server user group. I'm organizing an event called SQL Friday, which is at noon, unfortunately for you, though it's noon Central European time. So I guess for you, that's something like 4 a.m. Uh, this is not the best time, uh, but it, it's an online event that, that is run every week. So I've done it for, I think it's, we had SQL Friday number 52 this Friday. So, and it, it continues and it's a lot of fun to just meet data professionals an hour every week and, and have a chat and, and see a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm a uh, data platform MVP and I'm a Microsoft certified trainer doing the different SQL Server related uh, courses. Uh, when I'm not doing training, which I don't do that much, to be honest, I do uh, SQL Server consulting uh, out of my own company, Transmocopter SQL AB. Uh, we are one employee and that's me, uh, so it, it's kind of a freelance gig that I do. If you want to download the scripts after the presentation or if you want to look at any of my other presentations, you can uh, go to github.com slash transmocopter. You can look me up on Twitter where I'm at transmocopter. Maybe you see the pattern. Transmocopter is the name. Uh, and my email address magnus at transmocopter.se. My last name is Alqvist, although you don't have to say it. You can just type at Transmocopter on Twitter because that's where I usually respond the fastest. I see someone in the lobby. I'm going to let them in. So the session contents is, uh, I said before the presentation uh, in a LinkedIn thread that uh, it's a no slide presentation. And this is the third slide out of four so i was lying it's not a no slide presentation but it's very focused on demos uh, and uh, it, it's two reasons i really can't do interesting slides uh, and i think it's very hard to present code or scripts without actually showing them so i think demos is the perfect way to do it so i'm going to head on over to uh, visual studio code uh, and I'm going to start with something which isn't that much PowerShell related, to be honest. I'm going to set up our environment that we're going to use for the demos. And usually when I do a SQL Server related demo, I set up the environment beforehand. But uh, that's no fun. Uh, we're going to create two instances that we're going to play with. And we're going to do that by uh, starting or creating Docker containers. So if you haven't worked with Docker containers at all, it's very easy to get started. Uh, I think this script, the setup containers part, just look it through. It isn't much harder than this to just get a development environment on your own machine. What you need to do is download Docker for Windows and then you're good to go. Uh, if you're running Linux, uh, you can do some apt get install yada yada Docker uh, and that will give you the Docker you know, service that will run the containers for you. Uh, so we're going to start with pulling. Oh, this is the wrong container. Ha, ah, it's supposed to be server. I was playing with Red Hat containers, but I'm going to use the Ubuntu based ones. So Docker pull from the Microsoft container registry dot Microsoft.com slash MSQL slash server colon latest and that's going to give me the latest version of SQL Server containers downloaded as an image to my machine. So I'm going to run it. And it's going to get, download it incrementally. So it has a base container and then all the patches are, patches are in their own container. So we're doing a download. It's going to take a little while, but not that long because I have the most part of the containers already downloaded. So as you can see, we have one it's 385 megabytes, but I'm going to keep it running for a little while uh, while I talk you through the rest of the setup. So these, this is cleanup, which I already did. 
the next thing we want to do uh, while this is downloading is normally in a container, uh, when you stop the container, everything that you created inside the container in terms of you know, objects and, and so on is gone. So when you start the container again, it's going to be empty or it it's going to be as it was when you created it. But since we're running a, um, a SQL Server container, we probably want to have the data persisted. So the way to do it is by creating volumes. So I'm going to create one volume per container that I'm going to fire up. So Docker volume creates SQL volume one and two. That's how long it takes. And then I'm going to create two containers. Uh, so we do Docker create. We have some environment variables, accepting the license agreement for SQL Server, setting an SA password. And you have to set an SA password. That's kind of an environment variable. And then when the container is created and the first time it started, the SA password is set inside the master database. Uh, but now you can see my SA password. So the way to do it is just set a password and then as soon as the container is started, connect to it and change the password to something else so that your scripts don't reveal your actual SA password. Um, I'm going to want to enable the MS SQL agent because then I can create jobs inside my container. I'm going to give a name to the container and it's going to be SQL 1 and SQL 2. I'm going to map the volumes. So SQL volume 2 is mapped to this path inside the container. So slash var opt ms SQL. Uh, and this path, as you can see, it's a Linux path. And if you run a SQL Server container, it's going to be a Linux container. But for you as a SQL Server developer, it's going to make no difference. Uh, it's the same database and there is no difference whatsoever. The next thing you want to do is to map a local port on your machine to a port number inside the container so that you can connect to SQL Server in the container from your SSMS or whatever you use. Uh, so I'm mapping port 1402 to map po to port 1433 inside the container. Uh, and then I just say which container image do I run? And it's the one that I just pulled. So MCR uh, Microsoft com slash MS equals slash server. And I'm creating two containers. And that is how long it takes to install SQL Server as a container. Uh, and then I'm going to start my containers. One, two. Uh, so if you've done installations on Windows on premise, you know, install SQL Server for yourself. Even if you did it scripted or however you did it, it hasn't been this fast. So basically to install using a Docker container will take you five seconds. Uh, and I think it's so handy for development environments because I can fire them up. I can run my tests and I can just kill the container and it's gone. And I don't leave any trace of it on my machine. So I don't need to have 45 different instances with different settings installed on my machine. I can just do it in containers and then stop them and kill them and just save the configurations in a Docker file. So uh, not strictly PowerShell, but I do love containers. So I just wanted to show you what my dev development environment for this uh, demo looks like. Next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to copy a backup file from the AdventureWorks 2014 database to my container uh, so that I can later restore it into SQL Server in the container. Uh, when you start a container, uh, I mean, it starts instantly, but then SQL Server is going to take a while to fire up. So what you can do is using Docker logs command to look inside the container for the output which comes to standard out, which will be the error log from SQL Server. So I can see that it's done. And the thing you want to look for in the log is basically this. The service broker endpoint is in disabled or stopped state. Uh, and then a few lines later, you will have service broker manager has started. When you see that in the log, that means all your databases are fired up. So you can start using the, the container. 
All right, that's containers. One thing I, I want to do when I use containers is to create aliases for them because I don't like to remember the port numbers of, of the port mapping I did. So usually I create client aliases. So that's the first DBA tools we're going to look, DBA tools command we're going to look at. It's get DBA client alias to explore which client aliases do I have already. I'm going to run this. And uh, let's give some room for the output. We got some 32-bit aliases and some 64-bit aliases. And this by itself, I think, is a reason to use DBA tools to create your client aliases, because whenever you do it with a configuration manager, at least I, I go into network configuration, I create an alias and it works, and then I try to connect to it from Excel or something, and it doesn't work because Excel is using a 32-bit architecture and SSMS probably a 64-bit architecture. So I remember to create a 64-bit one and forget to create a 32-bit one. Uh, if you use DBA tools to create them using new DBA client alias, it's going to by default create TCP aliases for both 32-bit and 64-bit or uh, whatever type of uh, uh, alias you, you create. It could be, you know, name pipes or and so on, but it's going to remember to do it for both 32 and 64-bit architecture. Uh, but as we can see, I already created the aliases. There is one thing I don't like about PowerShell. Uh, and it's when you use PowerShell core. You can see down at the bottom here, if I move myself out of the picture, uh, we can see that I have PowerShell 7.1. Uh, and that is PowerShell core, the latest version. Um, and with PowerShell core, you cannot refer to client aliases. So even though I created them, I'm not going to use the aliases throughout, aliases throughout the, the presentation. Uh, and I think this has to do with uh, in, I mean, PowerShell core is supposed to be cross-platform and client aliases heavily rely on the Windows registry, which you don't have in the Linux uh, OS, for example. Uh, and so with, you can still use get DBA client alias. It's going to work on, um, if you run it on Windows with PowerShell core, uh, it will work to create client aliases, but you cannot refer to the client aliases from the different DBA tools commands. I think they are working on exposing it so that the functions will be smart enough to know if they are on Windows or not. And if they are on Windows, they will use the aliases. But for now, it's not supported to use the alias names in, uh, in DBA tools. So let's switch to something that actually does work. Some intro first. To use DBA tools, you need to install it. And to install a PowerShell module, you use the commandlet install module. So you do install module, the name, which is DBA tools, the default repository, which is installed with PowerShell for you, is going to be PS Gallery. I have multiple repositories set up, so I explicitly name PS Gallery as the repository I want to get DBA tools from. I scope the installation to all users. If you want to scope the installation to all users, you have to use an elevated prompt. Uh, otherwise, you can scope it to just yourself, and then you don't need an elevated prompt. And then with the force flag, I force the installation to run. Even if I already have DBA tools installed, it's going to force the latest version to be installed. So kind of uh, it doesn't overwrite the previous version, but it does download the newest version and that becomes the, the actual version that you will use. Once you have installed DBA tools, and you realize that this is kind of a cool open source project and I want to take part of it, uh, you can download the development branch of DBA tools to see the latest development that is ongoing. You can test some new functions and so on. 
and you do that with update DBA tools with the development, so dash development switch. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to have experimental features when I do the demo, uh, but if you find DBA tools interesting, then why not try to download the development branch and test some features and give feedbacks to the developers of DBA tools to, to help the community. So I am going to set up some variables with PowerShell, uh, a password, and uh, when I have the password as a secure string, I'm going to create a credential object for the SA account with the secure password that I just created so that I can connect to my containers. And I know uh, it's not you're not supposed to use the SA account for anything. Uh, and I know that, but it's a demo. If you run this for yourself and you want to really use uh, PowerShell and DBA tools, you of course already have your credentials created. You have your logins and you will use them. Probably you have Windows authentication if you have a, a Windows instance. So then you don't need to do all this. But I have a Linux container and the only login I have to begin with is the SA login. So that's what I'm going to use throughout the demo. So creating the variables. Uh, then the first thing I usually do when someone tells me that, OK, Magnus, here you have an instance. It's yours. Uh, make it work. Make it secure. Make it do backups and so on. I usually want a utility database where I can put my own objects for maintenance, and I usually call it DBA. So I'm going to start with creating a new database in my instance by using the new DBA database command. And maybe by now you have seen a pattern all the DBA tools commands uh, are named a verb, and that's a, how a command that should be named in, uh, in PowerShell. You should always have a verb and then a dash, and then there is a prefix to the noun, and the prefix is DBA. And that is because someone might create the command let new database then you get a name conflict, which new database, the one from my module or the name, the one from another module. Uh, and so in DBA tools, all the commands are named, sorry for removing these code, all the commands are named verb dash DBA and then the noun. So new DBA database. I want to connect to the SQL instance localhost on port 1401. I'm going to log in using the credential that I just created. And I'm going to create the database named as my variable DB name. And the owner of my database should be SA. And I have a database. We can use get DBA database SQL equal instance local host on equal credential my credential and we run this and we can see okay which databases do I have I have the DBA database and I have the MSDB database the model database etc so get DBA database is going to list the databases unless you give it the database switch or the database uh, parameters and then you can say I want to see if there is a database named DBA and yes it is and I can see some properties like uh, the status the recovery model etc etc so when I have my database I usually want some standard scripts or procedures so I probably want to have uh, Ola Hallengren's maintenance solution to be able to do backups, restores, index maintenance, and what have you, um, integrity checks. I want to have Brent Osar's first responder kit because I really like SP Blitz or SP Blitz index. So those are procedures that I use a lot as a DBA. And I want to have Adam Mechanics SP who is active procedure. 
And the, the good thing about DBA tools, the people who create DBA tools, they are DBAs. So they also want the same things that I do. Uh, so they have created the command let's install DBA maintenance solution, install DBA first responder kit, and install DBA who is active. So this one is going to install those three packages for me. So I'm just going to run this. It will go out on the internet, download them for me, uh, and install them onto the instance that I'm uh, that I connect to. The instance itself doesn't have to have internet connectivity, but the machine that you run the command from needs uh, internet connectivity to be able to download the, the different packages. I'm going to do this and you see that a lot of things are happening. There are some warnings because in uh, first responder kits, some objects are created in the wrong order. So one procedure is referring to another procedure which is created further down in the script. Don't worry about it, they will still work. So. The next thing I want to do, I want to create a login for maintenance tasks. So I create the login, uh, which is, okay, so uh, I have a password for it. I have a login splat, and if you haven't seen splatting, uh, as a technique in, uh, in PowerShell, uh, it's very handy because it makes your code kind of readable. So it's it's nothing else than hash table with uh, some variables, SQL instance, SQL credential, password, and password policy enforced are the four different uh, parameters that I want to send to the commands that create logins later on. Uh, so I create the splat. And then I can use new DBA login. And I give it the login splat that I just created. And then I add the parameter login. So I want to create one login that I named DBA login. It has uh, uh, this password. And I tell it to not enforce the password policy because then the password will be kind of too weak because the password is PA55W.RD. That's not considered good enough. So let's create the login. I run it. I can run it again if I want. It's just going to give me a warning and no error. Um, and it's going to tell me that it already exists. I can add the force flag, and then it's going to create the login by removing the login and recreating it. I can create my second login using the same login splat. So now I have two logins uh, on my machine. And that's nice. So now I have them uh, uh, created and uh, we're going to use them later on when we look at some migration scenarios. The next thing I want to show is how to restore a database uh, using DBA tools. So the parameters that I want to use is the SQL instance, my login credentials, and the path to the backup file. Uh, and then I can use the command restore DBA database and just enter my restore splat. And then I can add some other parameters if I want, like uh, destination data directory. Um, let's say it's bar opt and the SQL data, which is the default path. So I'm not going to actually do it, but you can enter everything that you can do with the restore command, uh, restore database command in T-SQL. All those options are exposed in Restore DBA database. So just play with it if you haven't already. So I'm going to run this and we will see a progress and we will see that we have very soon a restored AdventureWorks 2014 database. And the command is going to return the information about my newly created database. So the computer name, the instance name, uh, the backup file that I used, and so on. And it's going to tell me that I logged in using a, log, uh, a SQL login, 
and it's going to tell me which files it created, an MDF file and an LDF file, and which command, SQL command it used to restore the database. So that's nice. Let's move on to the next scenario, which is backing up. Are there, by the way, any questions in the chat, Elena? I saw no questions in the chat, but I do have a question for you, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, so I saw your um, the designation localhost comma 1401. Is that the port for your container? Yeah, it is exactly. So when, when I created the containers uh, with Docker create, I did a port mapping. Uh, so I, I mapped port number 1401 to the port 1433 inside the container. Because when you, when you run SQL Server on Linux, you can't have multiple instances on the same machine. Uh, so so there, there is no concept like the SQL Server browser in uh, Linux, uh, in the Linux world. So therefore you have to have different port numbers for each, uh, each instance. So if I'm not doing that, if I'm not running containers, and if I wanted to use uh, the tools um, on my Windows SQL Server, do I need to specify yeah. port 1433, or do I just let say localhost and I'm done? You can just say localhost and you're done, or localhost backslash instance name or whatever. So it's just okay. when I connect to my containers that I need to do it on another port number. Okay, great. Good Thank question. you. So the next scenario that I want to show is backing up using uh, DBA tools. Uh, so I already created the credentials object. And I'm going to use a blob storage container. Uh, so name confusion, blob storage container. It's, it's just kind of a file share in the blob storage. Uh, even though it's called container, it's not the same thing as the SQL Server container that I'm connecting against. And so I'm going to open my browser and we can have a look inside my container, uh, the blob storage container. So we see that it's empty. I don't have any files. I can do a refresh of the page just to show that uh, it's an empty blob storage container, which is named backups. So moving back to my script. I create a variable to store the URL to my container. I need to have a shared access signature to my container to be able to connect to it. And the way to do it is to create a credential object in SQL Server uh, to, uh, to give it the, the secret to, to my um, kind of a password. So it's, it's a shared access signature with this password. And then I create a credential object in SQL Server so that I can connect from SQL Server to my blob storage. So blob storage URL and my plain text secret. They are just variables. Uh, and then anything that you send, which is password or secret of any kind to a DBA tools command, has to be a secure string. So therefore we will use blob storage password is convert to secure string. And then I enter my plain text secret to it. This is not a perfect way to handle secrets. You should use something like a, uh, uh, you know, a secured place to store passwords, a service within your network or, or some kind of Azure service to, to store your key. So kind of some kind of key store, but it's a demo, so I'm good with plain text. Uh, even though you download the demos afterwards, you will not be able to use this password because I'm going to remove the container after the demo. So no harm done. So as I said, we want to create a credential object in SQL Server, and we will do that with new DBA credential. Um, and a credential object to connect to a blob storage container uh, requires the identity to be exactly this string, shared access signature. It's not case sensitive, but uh, it can be nothing else than shared access signature. So, so there is no username. 
uh, and then you have a password. And by using the force flag, you're not asked if you really want to create the credential. And if you already have the credential, you're not asked if you want to overwrite it or not, which you probably want to do. If you change the password, for example, for the shared access signature, you want to recreate the credential. So the force flag is good here. Uh, so I am creating this credential object in my both of my containers, my SQL Server containers. And that way my SQL Server instances are able to connect to my uh, blob storage container uh, by using backup to URL or restore from URL. So that's kind of the whole reason. Uh, I could do this. Now I did it with two lines of code, so new DBA credential, so on. I could do it with just one line of code, and this is the way to do it. Either I uh, uh, add host comma 1401 and local host comma 1402 on the same line here, or I can pipe the two uh, host names or instance names, and then pipe them to for each object to create the credential inside each of those. This will work too, and it's going to recreate the credential objects. In my... The term for each object is not recognized. That's very interesting. And it's because I misspelled it for There we go. So it's recreating the credentials. I can run it over and over again. And it's just going to create the same credential again. Uh, so for automation, it doesn't matter if you create the, sa the same credential every day. Uh, you can just run it the same script. And then if you update the password, you will have your script download the password from a secure place and recreate the credential every morning or whenever you rotate the keys for your uh, your storage container. So now that I have my credential object, I can go ahead and do a backup. So I'm going to back up the DBA database. Uh, and I'm going to. Back it up to. My blob storage URL, so that's the uh, transpondcopter psdemo.blob.core.windows.net slash backups that I looked at in the browser. So let's run this backup. And it takes a little while, not that long, because it's a very small database. We can fire up my uh, browser again and reload the page, and we will see that I have a backup file. Um, now this is going to come to the root folder of my uh, of my storage container, and it's going to have this name, uh, database name underscore, and then some kind of timestamp string dot bak. I'm not happy with that naming convention, which is the default from backup DBA database. I can do something about it, so I will create a variable for my pattern. So I'm going to have the blob storage URL first, and then I want the string server name slash instance name slash backup type slash DB name. Uh, and for the backup DBA database command, I am uh, going to give it another parameter file path. backup path pattern. So Azure base URL is not going to be the root folder. It's going to be this uh, pattern that I just created. I want to have the file path, which will be the file name. And I want it to be DB name underscore timestamp underscore backup type underscore BAK. And that's kind of handy to differentiate between full backups and uh, diff backups because they're usually named dot BAK in the end, both of them. And then this switch is what will do the magic replace for me. So dash replace in name is going to replace server name with the actual server name, the backup type with the actual backup type, and so on. On it. 
and we have it and we can go to our storage container again and have a look and now i have a folder named localhost because that's the server name and an instance name and the sql server that's the name of the default instance that you will have if you only have a default instance backup type is full database name is dba and then I have the backup file dba underscore timestamp underscore full. So that's much nicer and I have a structure of my backup files now. So we're going to go ahead and back up the transaction log. I'm going to give myself some more space. So uh, the instance name, the credential, we have seen this, the name of the database. The type is going to be log instead of full. We want the backup to be compressed. We want the backup path pattern uh, that I created up here. Uh, we want to have the file path to be DB name, underscore timestamp, underscore backup type, dot TRM. Backup. Replace in name should be true. And this is kind of important when you do uh, transaction log backups because by default the timestamp format is going to be year, month, day, hour, minute. If you do transaction log backups as a part of a log shipping solution, which I will shortly show you, uh, you want to have the seconds included because it may be that you run transaction log backups every 10 seconds for your log shipping and then you don't want to have the same name for two different transaction log backup files. So then you have to change the timestamp point. So let's do that and actually back up the transaction log. Yay, there it is. Uh, I want to set a new recovery model for my AdventureWorks 2014 database because I think it's a simple recovery model when I restored it. So I'm going to set it to full using set dba db recovery model commandlet. So let's do that. And now I am going to create some SQL Server agent jobs to run my backups for me because even though you can of course do it with the um, dba tools, Usually you want to have a SQL Server agent job running backups with a normal backup command. So I will create the full backup and the log backup job. So I will create the jobs first. So now I have two SQL Server agent jobs. They're going to be kind of empty. Uh, I want to have some commands. So one to backup databases and one to backup uh, transaction log. So I them, and then I have a splat for creating the SQL Server agent job steps that I want to attach to my SQL Server agent jobs that I just created. So that's going to be this one, and then I use the command new DBA agent job step to create the job step to run backups in the full backup job and the job step to create transaction log backups in the uh, log backup job. So, and then the last thing you want to do when you create a SQL Server agent job is that you want a schedule for your jobs. So I have a splat with some shared parameters. So I want to connect to SQL instance uh, localhost 1401. Uh, my frequency type is going to be daily for both of the jobs. The frequency interval is going to be one, and the frequency subday interval is going to be one. And then for the full backup, I have the frequency subday type of hours. And for the transaction log backup, I have frequency subday type of minutes. Uh, so one is going to run every hour, the other one is going to run every minute. So I create the schedules and attach them to the jobs. 
and now I can run a full backup from the SQL Server agent job by doing start DBA agent job. And if I did everything correct, it's going to work out of the box. Fingers crossed. So it's starting the job. We can move to the container, have a look. Let's go down, 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 down. So we have localhost. Actually, it's this one, sorry. So we have AdventureWorks 2014, full, uh, and the name of the backup file, uh, AdventureWorks 2014, full, yada, yada. And I should have transaction logs in not too long. They're running every minute. So probably if we wait a little while, we can go in and see that we get transaction log backups as well. But trust me, they will be there. Here we have one for the DBA database. Perfect. So then we can move to the next and probably most fun demo, which is to migrate an instance. I think we are 10 minutes left or something. Is that right, Elena? Yes, you are correct. Sorry, it's finding that unmute button that's taking me time. You are correct. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So 10 minutes and then some question and answers, I guess uh, we will have time for before the next session. So I will uh, speed up a little bit. And I lost my earpiece, so I put in a new one. We do have lunch after this, so if you uh, were to run over and take a little time, extra time, as long as you don't mind sticking around, we can um, stretch it out. All right. Then I will try to not slow down too much, but at least I don't have to speed it up that much. Uh, it's 20 past 9 p.m. here, so I'm okay with sticking around for a while. Uh, so th the first command that I want to show that has to do with the migration, it's the one that Chris Lemaire, who started this whole DBA tools module work, and uh, she created start DBA migration as a kind of the commandlet for migrating databases. And that's the the use case that she was working on when creating DBA tools. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, run the start DBA migration commandlet, and I'm going to use the dash what if switch. This is kind of common for uh, uh, for PowerShell modules or PowerShell functions. If you just want to know what the command would do, you can use the what if switch. Uh, and either the command will error out on you, tell you that I don't know what the what if switch is, but if you have a good uh, PowerShell developer who created the module, they have implemented the what if switch so that you can see what the command would do. So let's run that for start DBA migration. And we're going to look at the output. There is quite a lot that this command would do. It's updating recovery interval. It's updating allow updates, etc., etc. So basically, what you give the command is a source and a destination, uh, and then the number of other parameters. You can exclude some steps and so on, but it's going to perform a huge number of operations to copy settings from one instance to another, copy databases, copy logins, copy service broker queues, everything. Uh, and it may very well be that you don't want to use this command because it's doing too much. You don't trust it. You want to create your own runbook. Then I think running start DBA migration with the what if switch is a fantastic way to get your runbook because all those things that the command will do, these are things that you need to con consider when you migrate from one instance to another. It may very well be that you don't have to do anything, but you need to take a decision. Do I need to copy the query governor cost limit? Do I even use it? Uh, 
do I want to scan for startup procedures? Well, it depends on if you use them on your source instance. Well, then you probably want them on your destination as well. So all those things, is, there are things that you want to at least take an active decision. I do care about this. I don't care about this. I do care about locked process threshold. I don't care about it, etc. So fantastic command, which is giving some errors because I'm on a Linux container and some of these are uh, Windows specific. But fantastic command. We're going to make it a little bit more simple by manually doing login copies and then set up set up a log shipping solution. So I'm going to copy the two logins that I created. Uh, the let me see here. Ah, okay. I'm gonna just copy all the logins. Sorry. So, copy DBA login from source to destination, and it's gonna tell me that it did skip built-in administrators because it already exists on the destination. It uh, did successfully copy the DBA login. Login. It skipped. Uh, these two because they already exist on destination and then it did a copy of the second login login if i run the command again it will now tell me that it skipped all of them because they already exist on destination so successfully migrated i'm going to do the same thing with the um, my sql server agent jobs so copy DBA agent job. If I don't give it any job names, it's going to copy all the agent jobs. So it copied full backup and log backup. And this one, I can tell it to disable on destination. I can tell it to disable on source. So when you migrate the SQL Server agent job, some types of jobs, you don't want them running on both machines at the same time. So if you do disable on destination or disable on source, you make sure that they will only be active on one of the instances. Uh, to finally move the data, I could do copy DBA database, but then it will just copy the database and take it online. And you can tell it to take the database offline on the source server. But let's say you have one terabyte worth of data in your database, then it's going to take a while. Uh, and you don't really know when to switch your applications to use the new server. Or you have to time it. So that's why I want to set up log shipping instead. And I, I kind of love log shipping because it's so simple. It's transaction log backups taken on the source, copied to the destination and restored. Super simple. Uh, unfortunately, there is no built in functionality for using a Azure blob storage container as the shared folder. So therefore I have to create my own. And to do that, I create a database to keep track of my metadata for the log shipping. And I call it log shipping metadata because I'm, you know, my fan, I ran out of fantastic names for databases. I create a table in it, which I call log shipping watermarks, which kind of keeps track of which is the log sequence number I lost restored onto my secondary uh, for each database. So I have a database name in the table. I have a uh, the path to the last full uh, backup that I restored, because that's the way to set up log shipping. You restore a full backup, and then you start restoring transaction log backups on top of it. And the last log sequence number that I restored. This is the metadata I need for, uh, uh, for the log shipping per database. And I insert a row uh, into it which is going to be the DBA database. I put in a null value for the path to the last full backup that I restored because I haven't initiated it yet. And I use a zero as the last log sequence number that I restored. 
so let's run all these and I run them with invoke DBA query. I could just paste them into Management Studio, but uh, since I'm using PowerShell for everything else, I do invoke DBA query to run a query in my, uh, in my instance. Uh, so create database, create table, and insert log, insert log shipping watermark SQL. Let's run it. Now I want to find the last backup, last full backup for my DBA database. Uh, and I do that with get DBA DB backup history. And I tell the command to look for the last full backup that I did from my DBA database. And so I have this in a variable. We can look at the contents and we will see that this is the path to my last full. It's my uh, Azure blob storage. And I will now restore it to my secondary. Just restore DBA database but with a very important switch, no recovery. Because if you do it with recovery, it's going to take the database online and then you can't restore any transaction logs to it. So with no recovery, you keep it in restoring mode. If this works, I'm going to buy myself a beer afterwards. It did, so I get beer, good. Uh, and then I want to update my watermarks so that I know that, or my log shipping job knows that I have already restored the full. So I lost full to my parameter name, lost full, the log sequence number to zero, where my database name is the parameter DB name. So this is normal SQL, it's a parameterized query, and I run it with invoke DBA query. Now I have updated my metadata about my log shipping. Now I can start a log shipping. So I'm going to talk you through this whole script and then run it because it's, it's a loop and you have to run it all at once. So the first thing I want to do is to get, get the last log sequence number. So that's a select statement, select last LSM from log shipping watermarks where database name equals DB name. And then the DB name is DBA. And I get the last LSM item from that data set. Uh, this part we can actually do before running the rest of it. See that the last log sequence number is zero. Good. Then we do a for each loop. So for each log backup in get DBA DB backup history for my instance localhost 1401 and the database DBA, DBA where the backup type is log and the last log sequence number uh, is greater than or equal to the last log sequence number that I have in my metadata about my log shipping. So currently zero, but we will update it for each step of the loop. And then finally, I want to sort this uh, by the start date. So what it does is it looks at all the transaction log backups that have been created for the DBA database uh, since or with the log sequence number greater than zero. And it sorts them by the start date so that I can one by one restore them onto my secondary. I then convert the last log sequence number that I get uh, to an int 64 so that I can use it as a big int in the database. I uh, find the path, the backup path for the transaction log, which is returned by get DBA DB backup history. Uh, I then restore the transaction log backup with restore DBA database. Uh, the path we have here, the database name, 
I now hard code it to DVA. This should of course be a parameter so that you can do a for each loop, an outer for each loop to look at all the databases that you have log shipping for. And then in the inner loop, you should use that variable name that you get from the outer loop. But this is a simplified example. So I hard coded the name of the database. With replace, with no recovery, and the continue switch tells me that I want to restore a backup to a database which is already restored and is in uh, the restoring mode. So it hasn't done the recovery phase. Typically what you will do when you restore a transaction log backup. When I've done that, I'm gonna update my last log sequence number, number in my log shipping watermarks table and invoke that query. And that's about it. So let's run this whole for each loop and see what it does. It is restoring a transaction log backup and another one and another one and one more and one more. So it's going to do a few because as you remember, I created a transaction log backup job running every minute. So this first time that I run it, it may be that I maybe have 10, 15 backups to restore. They're kind of tiny, all of them. So we're just going to let it finish. And then we can have a look at the metadata that I now have in my log shipping watermarks table. And if you take this script and you put it into a PS1 file and you schedule it to run, uh, well, you probably need the, the login uh, credentials and so on as well that I have further up in the file. But this is the, the whole logic for your log shipping. So just run it. It's going to restore the transaction logs from the that it finds uh, in the blob storage container or on a file share for that matter, if, if that's where you put it. As long as your secondary can reach that file share or location, it's going to be able to restore the transaction log and you will have a working log shipping solution with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 11, 12 lines of code where two are debug outputs, so 10 lines of code. Uh, let's have a look at the contents of the table. Uh, okay, I want to do this and this and then do the And we see that this is the log sequence number. So if I now run this whole thing again, it's going to start with this log sequence number and then get the backups that were created after that log, last log sequence number. So one, maybe two more transaction log backups. I can schedule it to run every 10 seconds, every minute, every hour, whatever I want on my secondary. Uh, and the nice thing is you can schedule the actual job anywhere. You can have a batch server running it. It doesn't have to have a SQL server. As long as it has DBA tools installed, you can run this anywhere. It has to be able to connect to SQL 1 and SQL 2 and to wherever you created your uh, the metadata database, which I, in this example, created on my secondary, but you can put it on a, you know, Azure SQL database or whatever you want, anywhere that your batch server can reach it. So that concludes my last demo. Uh, there are a few more, uh, which I will not go through. Uh, one is how you can install SQL Server with DBA tools. Uh, very short one, but it takes a while. Uh, and one, how you can patch servers, which is kind of handy. And, and some uh, uh, tools to test if you are on the latest build and so on. So, have a look at them and last of all, have a look at dbatools.io and look at the command reference and just start playing because there is 
so much good in here. Each of these commands uh, in the documentation, they have examples and you can find tons of examples online on the blogs of the different contributors. If you go to team and you see all these people, they not only write code for DBA tools, they also share a lot of what they do with DBA tools on their blogs. So thanks to these guys uh, and thanks to all of you for listening. I hope that I was able to show you a quick introduction to things you can do with DBA tools. And I hope you will use DBA tools in your day to day work because it. There might be a short step to get into it. If you haven't used PowerShell, but once you start using it, you will be able to do things so fast and so reliably. Uh, that I do things with DBA tools and PowerShell that I don't know how I did it before I had this scripting tool, uh, to be honest. So it, it makes me so much more productive than I was before. So thank you for listening. Are there any questions, Lena? Thank you very much. So um, let me scroll up. We had a question earlier about where uh, um, your slides are, but I think you found them. Um, they're in your GitHub under presentations. Is that right? Oh, there, there it is. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. So, right there and then presentations and then the uh, the folder is I love DBA tools and then you will have the main demo code is the the PowerShell scripts that I used. Awesome this is an awesome presentation and you guys I shared the link to our YouTube channel this is being recorded and we will share the recording on our YouTube channel once we've kind of uh, processed it and uh, you will be able to rewatch it again and use those DBA tools. I'm really looking forward to them. I'm not a DBA, but I'd like to know. It's always helpful. It is. I and have I actually that. one more slide that I forgot to show. And well, let's do one. that then. It says, thank you, Data Saturdays Redmond. That's very sloppy of me because I copied it from another presentation. So uh, thank you, SQL Saturday LA uh, is what it's meant to say. And uh, but more than that, thank you all the sponsors uh, and thank you to all the contributors of DBA tools. Uh, and my final last words, automation replaces random mistakes with consistent errors that you can fix once and then you won't see them anymore. So that's why you should use PowerShell and or any other automation tool, to be honest. But I think PowerShell is a good one. Well said. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you for staying late and giving us uh, your time. We really appreciate it. And we know you love us, even if it said Redmond. And everyone now says right. thank you. Now it's SQL Saturday LA. <laughs> That's right. Maybe next year you come out and visit us. I hope so.